Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers Life. Today I'm going to teach you how to figure out if an all-in-one solar generator, like a Goal Zero Yeti or Energy Kodiak, is better for your purposes than a DIY solar setup. Now by the end of this video, I will have given you five questions to ask yourself and the reasoning behind those questions so that you can determine for yourself which solar solution is going to be best for your own purpose. Before we jump right in, I have a blog post on this particular video that will give you more insight and numbers that I think you'll find incredibly valuable. And I'm going to be referencing to that a few times throughout this video. I'll link to that post up here, but if you want to finish this video first, it's totally fine, as I've got an end card so that you can access the blog post there or through the video description. So let's jump in. What is a solar generator? A solar generator is an all-in-one solar power package, if you will. It's a box that typically includes a solar controller, an inverter, a battery monitor, and plugs, which makes it a convenient and portable grab-it-and-go solution to adding solar to a camper van. Now, solar guru keyboard warriors get upset with the term solar generator, but it's the marketing term that's being used by all of the companies making the product as well as the people like you who are searching for information on these products. So for this video, when I say solar generators, I'm referring to those all-in-one units like a Goal Zero Yeti or an Energy Kodiak. Now there are several other companies making products like this, but to keep the video to the point, we're only gonna be talking about the Goal Zero Yeti and the Energy Kodiak. There are two Goal Zero Yeti units that we're going to be talking about today, and they are the most powerful ones the Goal Zero Yeti 3000 and the Goal Zero Yeti 1400. They both have lithium batteries, but the main difference between the two units is the size of that battery. The 1400 has a battery capacity of 113 amp hours, and the 3000 has a battery capacity of 244 amp hours at 12.6 volts. Neither unit has 12 volt car charging natively built into it as of the making of this video, but a workaround would be to purchase a small 300 watt plug-in inverter to charge with, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Both units can charge from the wall at a rate of 10 amps. The included charging cord will charge at 5 amps DC, but the Goal Zero Yeti units can charge using dual charging cords at a combined rate of 10 amps DC. To fully charge the battery in the Goal Zero Yeti 3000 or Yeti 1400 units from a 110 volt plug in the wall would take 25 hours for the Yeti 3000 or 12 and a half hours for the Yeti 1400. Back to the inverter charging. Buying an additional small plug-in style 300 watt inverter capable of supplying the 10 amps DC to the Goal Zero is pretty straightforward in hardware. Since the charge rate from the alternator through the inverter is still 10 amps, the charge time would still remain the same at 25 hours for the Yeti 3000 and 12 hours for the Yeti 1400. Goal Zero Yeti 1400s and 3000s can charge at a max of a combined 480 watts of solar panels. Recently, they released an MPPT solar controller add-on, which makes the units charge even faster via solar. This comes pre-installed on the Yeti 3000s, but it must be purchased separately for the Yeti 1400. For the rest of this video, all figures regarding the Yeti 1400 will be based off the assumption that the MPPT controller will indeed be added to the Yeti 1400. As I said, both units can charge at a max of 480 watts, but the solar wiring is a little funky. They have to be wired as a 360 watt group and a 120 watt group. More info about that can be found on the blog post. If wired to the maximum solar capacity, the Yeti 1400 and 3000 would charge in as little as 3 hours for the 1400 and 6 hours for the Yeti 3000. The Energy Kodiak. Now there is only one model of Energy Kodiak and it has a 90 amp hour lithium battery. It can charge at a rate of 19 amps from a normal household plug, which would charge the unit in about 11 hours. The unit can charge via 12 volt car charger at a rate of 19 amps DC, which would charge a completely drained unit in about five hours. It can charge via solar through its PWM charge controller with a maximum input of 600 watts of solar, which would charge a completely depleted battery in as little as two and a half hours. Now, the energy unit is unique because additional batteries can be added. Battery capacity can be increased, but the main thing to keep in mind here is that even though you could double, triple, quadruple, whatever your usable battery bank size, your charging rate can't increase and an additional charge controller cannot be added. 
So if you add a 100 amp hour AGM battery to give an extra 50 amp hours of usable battery, your charging times would increase to 16 hours via wall outlet, seven and a half hours via 12 volt car outlet, and three hours and 45 minutes via 600 watts of solar. If you add another 100 amp hour AGM battery to add yet another 50 amp hours of usable battery for a total of 190 usable amp hours, your charging time would increase to 22 hours via one 10 volt wall outlet, 10 hours of driving, or five hours from 600 watts of solar. External lithium batteries are not able to be connected to this unit, so AGM will be your only good option. On the Energy Kodiak unit, there's a 30 amp plug for plugging in a shore power plug from an RV. To me though, this isn't a selling point as you can use a $10 30 amp to 15 amp adapter with the Goal Zero unit to achieve the exact same thing. Don't be fooled that by plugging a 30 amp plug into either of these units though means that you can run 30 amps of power like an RV air conditioner. 30 amps of AC power equals 3300 watts, which is too much for the integrated inverter to handle. Now, we've talked about the individual specs and differences of each unit, but here's how the Goal Zero Yeti 1400, the Goal Zero Yeti 3000, and the Energy Kodiak are the same. They all have pure sign inverters with a continuous rating of 1500 watts and surge ratings of 3000 watts. This means they can run most of your 110 volt household appliances like a coffee maker, an instant pot, or even an induction cooktop, given you've got adequate battery power remaining. They're all quality units. Although we don't personally use one in our van, I've had plenty of hands-on experience with them to say that they're all, they're all good units in regards to construction. They are easy. Once you decide that this is the direction you're going to go, it's very simple to just get up and running. There's only a few external connections that you need to make, and you don't have to learn near as much about solar as you would in a DIY setup. Now, let's talk about the four negatives of these units in general. Number one, on the Goal Zero units, I hate that we have to jump through hoops to wire up the maximum 480 watts of solar. Wiring through, I'm assuming, two internal charge controllers, which force us to have to use a 120 watt solar panel and a 360 watt solar panel array to make it worse, there's an incredibly limited selection of 120 watt monocrystalline panels or panels that wire up to a combined 480 watts for that matter. To actually get the 480 watts of solar is kind of challenging because of that. But once I find a really good source for that, you know it'll be on the blog post. So check there for updates. Number two, I hate that the Energy Kodiak has a PWM charge controller. It's outdated technology that forces you to use more solar panels to get similar output than there might be in regards to DIY or even the Goal Zero unit. Number three, neither the Goal Zero unit or the Energy Kodiak units are eligible for wiring in series, which forces you into parallel wiring the entire thing, which causes more wiring and fewer solar panel options, more complicated uh, roof entry glands, everything like that. It's just kind of more complicated. Number four, the ease of design of these units by nature makes them less expandable than their DIY counterpart. So if you need more expandability and more capacity down the road, you've got fewer options. Which one should you get, the Goal Zero or the Energy Kodiak? So now we're actually comparing two groups of products, the Yeti 1400 versus the Energy Kodiak and the Yeti 3000 versus the Energy Kodiak plus additional batteries. Comparing the Yeti 1400 and the Yeti 3000 is not a good comparison, as the only difference is battery size. You really need to do a power audit to determine how many amp hours you will use throughout the day. That number will give you a better idea regarding which unit size is right for you. The Goal Zero 1400 and the Energy Kodiak unit are fairly comparable in terms of price and performance. If I had a need for a 100-ish amp hour battery unit like either of those two, I think I would personally overlook the less than ideal alternator charging ability and the long charging times via 110 and still go with the Goal Zero unit. The 600 watt capacity of the Energy Kodiak unit is attractive, but the lack of MPPT charger makes the added solar capacity a bit of a wash. Also, the Yeti 1400 has a slightly bigger integrated battery as well. Now, I still recommend the Energy Kodiak unit as a great unit. Perhaps it's a toss up between the two units. 
But if I replace an awkward you must choose scenario, like I'd probably just go with the goal zero unit. Now, if I needed closer to 200 amp hours of battery capacity, I'd be going for the goal zero over the Energy Kodiak plus additional AGM batteries. We've already done a thorough discussion on AGM versus lithium batteries, so I don't need to go over that again. But if it were possible to add external lithium batteries to the Energy Kodiak unit, maybe it'd be another toss up between the two. But cornering me into using only AGM for added external batteries tilts the scale towards the bigger Goal Zero Yeti 3000 unit. Now, if I were fine with AGM, I'd need 300 amp hours of AGM batteries to get to the additional 150 usable amp hours to make the Energy Kodiak's battery storage capacity on par with the Yeti 3000 battery storage. Now, three times 100 amp hour Renogy AGM batteries would be about 600 bucks. That'd put the Energy Kodiak plus extra batteries at nearly the same price as the Goal Zero Yeti 3000. So if I were okay with AGM batteries, I'd still go with the Yeti 3000. Although a very tight race between all three very, very good units, I still recommend the Goal Zero Yeti units in this particular comparison. Perhaps you've noticed that I'm not talking many actual numbers in regards to price in this video. I'm doing that on purpose though, as to not sway your decision on the price of the products as those prices are constantly changing. You can check current prices at explorus.life slash shop or through the links in the description below. A DIY solar solution. Now in the past, I thought a DIY solar system for your camper van was the best, most cost effective way to do things across the board. Now I know that's not necessarily the case, which is why I'm doing this video. Designing a DIY camper solar setup is out of the scope of this video in particular, but I've got many more blog posts and videos that'll help you out with that. But I want to run through the main pros and cons of a DIY camper solar setup, specifically relating to the Goal Zero unit I highly recommended earlier. Pros of a DIY solar setup. Number one, they are infinitely customizable. You want a 300 amp hour battery bank? Perfect. 3000? Cool. <laughs> How about 800 watts of solar? No problem. Add a second charge controller and ramp it up to 2000 watts of solar? Sweet, let's do it. If you want it, you have the budget for it, we can build it. Number two, all of the individual components in a DIY setup are up for swapping out with components that fit your personal needs. Number three, DIY solar setups have the capability of being more powerful. Number four, the Goal Zero tops out at 240 amp hours of battery. There is no upper end to DIY. Number five, Goal Zero tops out at 480 watts of solar. There is no upper end to DIY. Number six, the Goal Zero Yeti takes 25 hours to charge its fully depleted 240 amp hour battery bank from a wall outlet or driving, whereas a DIY solution would only take three to four hours. Goal Zero units have a one year warranty. DIY solutions obviously depend greatly on the components used, but for example, Battleborn Lithium Batteries is offering a 10-year warranty. Victron, who makes charge controllers, inverters, and such, they have a five-year warranty. Number eight, solar knowledge. Simply by installing solar yourself, you'll have a greater understanding of how your electrical system in your camper works and how all the parts work together. Number nine, the ability to troubleshoot. Since you'll have access to each component, if something breaks or malfunctions, you'll be able to pinpoint exactly what component is causing the problem in your system. Now, the downsides of a DIY solar setup. Number one, DIY is less bang for your buck in a sub 200 amp hour system. Now bear with me, bear with me, just, just keep watching. Number two, you're gonna have to spend more time assembling your desired parts. Number three, on a DIY solar setup, you're gonna spend more time picking out parts and figuring out wiring diagrams, unless it's already been provided for you like what you'll find on explorers.life slash solar wiring diagrams. Now, let's compare DIY to Goal Zero from a cost standpoint. If we were going to build a DIY setup similar to the Goal Zero Yeti 1400, we would need a 50 amp charge controller, an inverter charger, a 100 amp hour lithium battery, time out. With just those parts, we've already racked up a hardware bill similar to the price of a Goal Zero Yeti 1400. Let's move on. If we were to build a DIY setup similar to the Goal Zero Yeti 3000, I'd need a 50 amp charge controller, an inverter charger, two 100 amp hour lithium batteries. Stop. With those parts, we are already at the same price point as the Goal Zero Yeti 3000. What I'm trying to say is the DIY solution is not more cost effective than the Goal Zero Yeti units for a comparable size system. 
Now, that's sizing your system according to your budget, but it's a really, really good idea to size your system according to your actual power usage. That's why you need to do a power audit. Now stay with me, I've got a lot of numbers coming your way really quick, but by the end of the video, it's going to make sense. If your power audit comes back saying you'll need less than 100 amp hours per day, and you've got a hard budget of the cost of the Yeti 1400, to accomplish your camper electrical goals, the Goal Zero Yeti 1400 is going to be the best bang for your buck. If your power audit comes back saying you'll need less than 240 amp hours, and you've got a hard budget of the price of the Goal Zero Yeti 3000 to accomplish your camper electrical goals, the Goal Zero Yeti 3000 is going to be the one for you. But perhaps this is a better way to judge for yourself. Here are seven yes or no questions to ask yourself to determine if a solar generator or a DIY solar setup is right for you. Do you want over 500 watts of solar panels? Do you want more options on what sizes of solar panels that you can use? Did your power audit recommend more than 240 amp hours? Is charging quickly via the vehicle alternator a high priority? Is getting a full charge from a completely depleted battery overnight a high priority? Do you want your system to be modular for future system expansions? And is the budget for your electrical system over $2,500? If you answered any of the first six questions as yes, and the last question as yes, a DIY solution is going to suit your needs much better. If you said no to all of the above, I'd be pointing you in the direction of one of the Goal Zero units we've been talking about, either the Yeti 3000 or the Yeti 1400, depending on how your power audit looked. If you said yes to the first questions and no to that last questions, you're gonna have to make a sacrifice somewhere. Whew, we made it. So that's pretty much all there is for this video. I've got a lot more solar resources that you can find in the description, or you can click this link to head on over to the blog, which will give you a little bit more insight as to some of the things we just talked about. If you're ready to start your next solar video lesson, click over here. Now, if you've got questions, leave them in the comments section and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If this helped out, give it a thumbs up, share it with somebody who you think it'll help. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.